Yeah, so um, in this video, I'm going to get to talk about what we really mean by limit. So this is quite exciting um, because, you know, like until you really like get to see delta epsilon limit arguments, it doesn't it doesn't exactly click in all the way, all the way, 100 um, percent. But yeah, so that's why this definition is really cool. Um, but yeah, so in the past, um, if you're asked, you know, uh, does the limit exist at a particular x value, what you do is you look at the graph if you have the graph, and you look to see if the limit from the left is the same as the limit from the right. So you'd allow for removable discontinuities, but not jump discontinuities. So um, that's how you do it graphically. And then, of course, you had all these algebraic tools, including factoring and canceling a common factor that gave you trouble or multiplying by the conjugate to, you know, algebraically uh, compute the limit value, right? So you have those things, but that's not what a limit really means, right? So the limit, a, a limit really means this, which is if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x, um, the absolute value of x minus a being less than delta automatically implies that the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon, then you can say that the limit is x goes to a of f of x is equal to l. But wait, what? What does that mean? Um, all right, okay, so first in math we use uh, delta, and delta and epsilon to represent very small numbers generally, and as I said, this means there exists and this means for all, but otherwise, um, I think to make sense of this here, uh, let's first uh, visually represent that, right? What does is, what is the absolute value of x minus a being less than delta mean visually? Well, it means that if you had a, right, dead center here in the interval, then you are a delta away um, this way in this direction, and then a delta away this way. So you're uh, a delta amount on either side of a is what it's saying. So this point, this left end of the interval is going to be um, a minus delta, and the right end is going to be a plus delta. And similarly, this here will mean, and we're of course clearly on the x axis here, uh, maybe I shouldn't say clearly, but yeah, here now we're on the y equals or y axis or f of x axis, so y equals f of x. So we're on the f of x axis or on the y axis. And here, like that interpretation um, for that, for this guy, should be simpler now, which is that we've got an L here and we are an epsilon amount this way and then an epsilon amount this way. So here we have L plus epsilon, and here we have L minus epsilon. So this, this guy means that uh, we are an epsilon amount, amount on either side of L along the f of x or y axis, yeah? Cool, all right, um, but still kind of vague. All right, so, so here's what we're doing. Notice that this says for every epsilon greater than zero, and we said epsilon is normally a very small number. So, um, you know, while I've visually represented epsilon to be a certain length, uh, you could make it as small as your likes as long as it's greater than zero. So one thing you can do is make epsilon small enough to tighten the interval around L to be that guy, this little guy, instead of what it was, right? Now, of course, you can make it smaller and smaller, the interval around L, so use your imagination. You can make it arbitrarily small, so very, very close to L on either side, right? Okay, so what it's saying is, for any choice of epsilon you give me, I have to come up with a delta, so that for all x that are a delta amount on either side of A, we're going to take them and map them into the epsilon amount on either side of L. So let's say that a delta amount on either side of A is called a delta neighborhood about A, and then similarly, we have an epsilon neighborhood about, about L. So what we're saying is we decide on some epsilon, um, and so we created a, a, an epsilon neighborhood about L, as small as we'd like, and then what the task is to find a delta so that uh, a delta neighborhood about A will have all X's going to the epsilon neighborhood about L. Okay, so um, here we could actually literally kind of do it, which is, you know, you take an X, let's say here, and it's likely going to be mapped in this way, which is that X value is going to go to the Y value uh, over here. Yeah, something like that. And then I'll do it in a different color. And then let's say you pick an X here. 
then this x value is going to be mapped somewhere about here, let's say. Now, if I say, oh no, we're going to tighten the epsilon neighborhood, and ooh, I got to change my tool, my bad. And we say that the epsilon neighborhood is now tight enough to be this, then you have to find a delta so that the delta neighborhood about a will be small enough um, so that all x's in that uh, delta neighborhood um, about a, uh, let's say this x is going to go to uh, this now narrower epsilon neighborhood about l. So if you could do this for any epsilon, imagine tightening the epsilon neighborhood about l to be super, super small, as small as you can imagine. Then if I am able to then find an, a, a delta neighborhood about a that's like smaller, smaller, um, so that all x's uh, in that delta neighborhood are mapped to that super small epsilon neighborhood, and I could do this for any epsilon, then it must be true that the limit is I go to a along x is l um, along y or f of x. Yeah? Cool. So that's what that means. Now, I'll still, if this is not good enough, give you um, kind of a concrete example. So let's say that we choose epsilon to be uh, 0 0.01. Now, in this particular uh, function, uh, a line whose visual is given here, it's clear from what I've done here or just simply by uh, plugging in that the limit is x goes to um, 2 of this function 2x minus 3 is going to be 2 times 2 minus 3 which is 4 minus 3 which is 1 and of course the visual agrees as we go to 2 on either side uh, we go to 1 along the y right and I didn't label it but yeah f of x uh, or y axis and then x axis yeah okay cool <clears throat> So now we've said let epsilon be 0 0.01. So since L in this case is 1, right? The limit L is 1, the limit value. Uh, in deciding epsilon is this amount, we're saying let's tighten our epsilon neighborhood and make it go from, um, make it go from uh, 0 0.0, sorry, 0 0.99. I'm poor at arithmetic, so check that 1 minus 0 0.01 is 0 0.99, but I think it is. Uh, so the interval now is from 0 0.99 to uh, 1.01. This one is a bit easier. Okay, cool. So, so we've tightened the epsilon neighborhood so that we go from 0 0.99 to 1.01 0 .01, uh, about 1, the y value 1. And what we need to do is come up with a delta so that uh, all x values in that delta neighborhood about um, x equals 2, which is what a is, right, uh, in this case. So is, um, uh, the delta neighborhood about x equals 2 is going to be tight enough so that all x's in there are going to be mapped between 0 0.99 and 1.01. .01. Well, I can do it very cheaply here. I could just say, hey, yeah, like make delta equal to 0 0.00001. All right, and I'm sure like I've made delta so small that all x's that are in the interval 2 minus this number here, uh, 2 minus delta, and then 2 plus delta are going to certainly go between 0 0.99 and 1.01 uh, along uh, the y-axis. Um, in fact, we can, we can check one of them, right? We know that the left endpoint is like, uh, or let's use the right endpoint because of my arithmetic. So that's going to be 2.000, uh, uh, zero, 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 how many zeros? Zero, 01. So even if we plugged this guy into um, this function to get the corresponding y value, it's going to say 2 times this and then um, minus 3. And so we know that that's going to be uh, sufficiently smaller than 1.01. .01. You can do it in your calculator. Um, so yeah, so you get it, you get it. But but the problem is, what about if you wanted to be cruel and give me a super uh, small epsilon? Well, I can make a guess for a delta, and if my, my guess for a delta doesn't work, then I could just pick a smaller one and pick a smaller one until it works. But this is impractical, because this is a challenge that will never end, which is like, like you can keep telling, telling me newer epsilons and I have to keep finding newer deltas. So instead of doing that, what we do is create a generic relationship between delta and epsilon, so a way to relate delta and epsilon, so that I could just say, hey, for every epsilon you give me, 
uh, this is the expression for delta, and it's related to epsilon in this way. So it's like cut epsilon in half or cut it by 10, and it will always work. So we want to create that kind of a relationship. So that's how you actually go about proving limits for um, functions, and that's what I'm going to do here, which is give you um, that particular example and the case that um, the function is 2x minus 3. Um, so in videos to come, what I'm about to do next is what you'll see in the examples, because this is how you really prove that um, a particular function has a certain limit. So we're going to do it uh, to prove that the limit is x goes to 2 of 2x minus 3 is equal to 1. So to prove this using this delta epsilon argument, this is kind of a hypothesis. It's not kind of. It is a hypothesis. So you could just ignore it. You don't have to rewrite it when you're writing the proof. But this is the proof of this limit. So we say proof. Okay, cool. So we start with this, which is we know that um, x minus 2 being less than delta needs to automatically imply uh, that we have um, 2x uh, minus 3, which is f of x, minus 1, which is minus L, is less than epsilon. We know we need this. Okay, cool. So let's manipulate this guy, and that's what you have to often do uh, for these kind of proofs. So uh, first, notice that we can write this more succinctly as um, 2x minus 4 is less than epsilon. And then next, notice we can take out a 2 and write 2 times x minus 2 is less than epsilon. And then next, we write absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 2. But wait, this is nice, and we were happy the minute we saw that expression anyway, because it's uh, a part of the delta expression. So now, since this is very similar to this, we can decide very easily that we should choose delta to be epsilon over 2 all the time. Um, and if we did, then, uh, then we would always have that whenever x minus 2 is less than delta, f of x minus l is less than epsilon. You want to check? All right, let's do it. Let's check check is um, we have uh, that x minus 2 is less than delta and we want to imply that um, uh, 2x um, minus uh, 3 minus 1 is less than epsilon which is we want to imply f of x minus l is less than epsilon but wait if we have this since delta is equal to epsilon over 2 we should automatically have x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 2. But wait, if this is true, then we can multiply both sides of this inequality to write that we have 2 times absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon. But wait, we can take this 2 inside and write 2x minus 4 is less than epsilon. But this we could rewrite as 2x minus 3 minus 1 is less than epsilon, which is exactly as desired up here, which is f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Yeah? Cool. All right. In the examples to come, I'm not going to do this sort of check, but I'm going to show you how to prove um, or how to choose a delta um, based on what the function you're given. Yeah? And everything else that you need. Yeah? Cool. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this.